What's up everyone and welcome back to the comms channel. Today's video is going to be part two of our deep dive into the radio configuration page. So jumping right into it, we'll start where we left off and that's going to be the position page where we'll have settings related to broadcasting your position across the mesh network. One thing to note is that your position gets transmitted via the primary channel that we covered in the previous video. For a default configuration, this is going to be the long fast channel with the default public encryption key. Even if you set up additional secondary channels with your own encryption, your position will still go out over the public primary channel, which is the default long fast channel. There is a way to protect your location from the public channel and only share it on your own encrypted channels, and that'll be covered in a future video. The first option here is the position broadcast interval in seconds, which is basically just how often you want to transmit your position to the mesh network. And the default here is 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes, and you can just adjust this to fit your needs. Next, we have a toggle switch for smart position enabled. And if you're using this feature, it's recommended that you leave the position broadcast interval that we just discussed as the default of 900 seconds. The nice thing about smart position is it'll notice that you're moving and update your GPS position more frequently and then go back to only updating every 900 seconds if you stop moving. Below that we have smart broadcast minimum distance in meters and what this setting does is tell the smart position broadcast feature to only start if you move further than whatever distance you set here. The final smart position setting we have is the smart broadcast minimum interval. This tells it to wait however many seconds before broadcasting another GPS update. Next up, we have a toggle switch for use fixed position. If we enable this, we'll see some new options pop up below for lat, long, and altitude. I'm sure there's a number of use cases for this, but one could be using this for a fixed node that doesn't have a GPS on it. Then below that, we have a toggle switch for GPS enable, and this basically just turns the GPS on or off on your node. Then below this toggle switch, we have two settings that are usually fine as default, and these options may actually go away at some point. And the first is the GPS update interval in seconds. And this setting tells the GPS how often it should try to get a position from the satellites. And below that we have fix attempt duration, which tells the GPS how long to try to get a GPS location. And then next we have a drop down menu for position flags with a number of options in it. And options that are checked are what's going to be sent in the position broadcast that your device sends out. So if we open this drop down menu, we'll see the following options with some checked and unchecked by default. And the defaults are going to be fine for most people, but going over them we have altitude, altitude MSL, which stands for mean sea level. And this is your true altitude above sea level. Then we have geoidal separation, and this is the value of the difference between the ellipsoid and orthometric height. Going into what this is is beyond the scope of this video, and you likely already know what this is if you want this option enabled. Then we have some DOP options, which stands for dilution of precision, which measures how precise of a location you're getting from the GPS. In the case of the DOP option, this uses a default of PDOP or position DOP, which gives a value based on how many satellites are spread throughout the sky. There are two other types of DOP values. There's HDOP, which is horizontal DOP, and VDOP, which is vertical DOP. And on the dropdown, we have a checkbox for HVDOP, which will send separate HDOP and VDOP values instead of the PDOP if preferred. Then we have a checkbox for sat in view, which will send how many satellites your device is picking up at the time. Next checkbox is for sequence number, which will send an incrementing sequence number per packet. Then we have timestamp, which is self-explanatory, and heading and speed, which are also self-explanatory. Then we finally have three options to redefine GPIO pins for devices that didn't come with a GPS and you add one later. You would redefine these pins here. And the next section we'll have is power. And most users won't need to mess with any of these settings since choosing a role for your device in the device config menu we went over in the previous video should handle the power settings that are best for that role. One thing on this page though that might be useful is the enable power saving mode. And this mode will turn off the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and screen and can be useful if you have a node that you don't need any of these turned on for. Then the next config page is going to be for network. 
And the first item on this page is a toggle switch for Wi-Fi enabled. ESP32 devices like the T-Beam and T-Deck, for example, have Wi-Fi capability. And RF52 devices like the WizBlock and T-Echo don't have Wi-Fi capability, so this won't apply to those devices. If you want to turn on Wi-Fi, you can turn on this toggle switch and enter in the SSID of your Wi-Fi, which is the name of your Wi-Fi, and then the PSK, which is the password of your Wi-Fi. One important thing to note is that if you turn on Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth will stop working. Both of them can't be on at the same time, so you have to pick one or the other. After turning on Wi-Fi, you'll see a page on the device's screen with the connection details. And you'll see a IP address and a URL. And you can visit these from a web browser and reach the web configuration page. And we'll cover that in a later video. Next, we'll see an option for NTP server, and that's the server that your device will connect to to get the current time. Leaving this as default should be fine for most people. Then there's a place to enter in details for an R syslog server if you have one and want to forward your logs to it. The next toggle switch is for Ethernet enabled. This will be for devices like the WizBlock, which have an Ethernet module available for it. Then you have a drop down with IP address options for DHCP, which will have your device ask for an IP address from your network, or an option for static that you can select and enter in specific IP address information in the appropriate fields below if you want a static IP. IP address. Moving on to the next config page, we have display. The first option is screen timeout in seconds, which is self-explanatory. Then we have GPS coordinates format, which has a default of decimal, but can be changed to a number of other options to fit your needs. Next up is the auto screen carousel in seconds option. And what this does, this will cycle through the different screens on the device at whatever interval you set here. The default is zero, which is off. Then we have compass north top, which will set the compass to always point north on your device's screen. Then below that, we have a toggle switch for flip screen, which flips the screen's orientation 180 degrees. Then we have display units, where you can switch from metric to imperial. We also have a drop-down menu for OLED screens, and the default is to auto-detect, but you can also select a specific driver if needed. Then there's another drop-down for display mode for devices with OLED screens and allows you to have a different color for the first line or invert the colors on the screen. Then we have two toggle switches, one for heading bold, which bolds the text at the top line to make it easier to read if needed. Then we have a toggle for wake screen on tap or motion, which can be used for devices that have an accelerometer to wake the screen up by tapping or moving the device. Next, you'll see a config page for Lore, but Lore is a bit more complicated subject that deserves its own video, so we'll skip this one for now and we'll get into that in the next video. So let's go into the Bluetooth config page. And this page is pretty simple and is where you can enable or disable Bluetooth using the toggle switch here. Then we have a drop down for pairing mode. If your device has a screen, the default will be random pin, which means you'll receive a random pin number on your device's screen when you try to connect to it via Bluetooth. If your device doesn't have a screen, the default will be fixed pin. And the default pin for devices with no screens is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But this can be changed in the fixed pin field below. And there's also an option for no pin, which I don't recommend. That'll do it for part two of the Mesh-tastic Radio Configurations Options videos, and I hope you found it useful. If you did, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already done so. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be covering the lore settings in its own video, and lore is an important part of Mesh-tastic, and that'll need its own video to go into, so be sure to stay tuned and join me for that. Thank you all, and have a good one.